Hello and welcome to the Origins of Islam. Today we want to look at the Prophet Muhammad's adopted son Zaid and his importance for Muhammad to becoming the seal of all prophets. Now, before we can do that, we have to have a look at the Muslim perspective on salvation history. So in the Arab traditions, God sends prophets to humanity with instructions about how to attain eternal life. The office of prophecy is the exclusive possession of a single family, the descendants of Abraham. Over time, the divine revelations were distorted. Hence, God sent Muhammad, a direct descendant of Abraham, in order to restore the true message. Only the faithful and accurate preservation of the revelations received by Muhammad makes it possible for the Muslim community to assert with confidence that he was the last prophet and that the office of prophecy terminated upon his death. So this is what Muslims today believe. Previously, we have looked at how the word Muhammad evolved from Muhammad I, the praised one, to Muhammad II, the seal of the prophets. However, there were intermediary steps. So, for Muhammad II, there was also an Alpha and a Beta version. The Alpha version was basically a preacher who taught the Arabs the gospel according to an anti-Trinitarian tradition. The Beta version was a prophet like the prophets before him. Now, the problem was that just like the teachings of the prophets before him, his teachings could be superseded. For the ruling Abbasids, whose legitimacy relied upon the truth of Islam, new prophets could pose a major threat. Therefore, it became necessary to cement the religion by declaring Muhammad the seal of the prophets. Once the seal of the prophets narrative was established, it was of utmost importance that Muhammad did not have any sons. Because as we have seen in Arab salvation history, the office of a prophet can only run within the family through a male lineage. If everyone knows that Muhammad didn't have any sons, there cannot be any new pretenders, making Muhammad the seal of the prophets by default. Therefore a narrative was constructed so as to make it clear that all of Muhammad's natural sons died before reaching the age of puberty. Muhammad's adopted son, Zaid, has the sole function to make it possible for Muhammad to become the last prophet. He was adopted so that Muhammad could end adoption, thereby making sure that everyone knows that Muhammad didn't have any sons, natural or adopted. And without sons, there cannot be any more prophets. Now, Zaid is a figure of salvation history, as we've just seen, and he has no function in secular history. And in Zaid, many religious symbols are condensed. He is Joseph, but instead of welcoming family reunification, he rejects his family in favor of his slave master. He marries Solomon as the beloved, upon whom God and you yourself have bestowed favor. Like Ishmael, he is repudiated by his father so that he won't be the heir. He becomes Abraham's trusted servant who secures a wife for Isaac when he informs Zainab of her marriage to the prophet. Like Uriah the Hittite, he is sent to a certain death on a battlefield in southern Jordan by the man who fell in love with his wife. Like the Isaac of some Jewish Midrashim, he is sacrificed by his father. He has to pass five tests in order for Muhammad to become the last prophet. First one is to remain with Muhammad instead of returning to his family. He has to expose himself to public humiliation by divorcing his wife so that she can marry his father. He has to endure the personal humiliation of informing his former wife that she is to be married to her father-in-law. He has to relinquish his status as Muhammad's son by name, Zaid bin Muhammad, and the right to inherit from the Prophet. And he willingly gives up his life for the sake of Muhammad and Islam. By the end, adoption is abolished despite previously being an established institution among the Arabs. Muhammad's own life story exemplifies this abolition. He famously adopted a son and then he rejected him as his son, leaving Muhammad without male heir and the office of prophecy hence no longer occupied, sealing the dogma of Muhammad as the last prophet. Muhammad's marriage to Zainab mirrors biblical stories. For example, Matthew 1, 18-21, when Joseph believes that Mary had been unfaithful and he contemplates divorcing her, an angel appears to him saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. This mirrors the story of the angel Gabriel coming to Muhammad, urging him to marry Zainab. Similarly, in 2 Samuel 11, 6-27, David covets Uriah the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba. He commits adultery and sends Uriah to his death. Just like Uriah, Zaid is sent to his death in battle, but the negative portrayal of David in 2 Samuel is one of the reasons why the Arabs accused the Jews of having corrupted scripture. 
So what we see is that the story of Zaid was told with the means of previous biblical stories, clearly showing that we're not dealing with secular history, but with salvation history. With the story of Zaid and Zainab, we have a second reason for why episodes in Muhammad's life were created. In this case, it was not about providing context, but about legitimizing Abbasid rule. And with that, we're at the end for today. In the next episode, we will have a look at how those updates brought to the Quran necessitated further changes down the line. Until then, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.